It's my pleasure tonight to introduce author, educator, and civic entrepreneur. I love that, civic entrepreneur. I think that's such a cool title. Uh, Eric Liu, he is the founder and CEO of Citizen University, which he'll tell you a little bit more about, and also executive director of the Aspen Institute Citizenship and American Identity Program. He's the author of several books. His most recent that's up on the screen there, You're More Powerful Than You Think, A Citizen's Guide to Making Change Happen, was released just this past March. Eric served as a White House speechwriter and policy advisor for President Bill Clinton and is a regular columnist for both CNN.com and a correspondent for TheAtlantic.com. Eric lives in Seattle where he teaches civic leadership at the University of Washington and hosts Citizen University TV, an award-winning television program about civic power, and I hope he'll tell us when and where we can find Civic University. In addition to speaking here tonight, Eric is serving as a University of Redlands Distinguished Fellow and has spent today speaking with numerous students and classes across our campus. Also, I wanted to let you know that we are recording tonight's program, so if you know people that weren't able to make it tonight um, or weren't able to get in, I hope you'll pass that information on to them. Please give a warm Redlands Forum welcome to Eric Liu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Eliane. I want to thank all of you for uh, being here tonight. Uh, actually, the first people I need to thank in absentia are my friends Jim and Deb Fallows, who some of you know from the Redlands community, who are um, uh, very directly responsible for my being uh, here today. It was uh, Jim and Deb who, well, Jim's from Redlands, but uh, uh, Jim and Deb had served as fellows at the university um, and so loved their experience that uh, uh, they, they urged me to uh, see if I could get myself uh, into the same ecosystem, and I have uh, loved it. I've, I've spent uh, uh, this day today uh, visiting with um, uh, four different uh, first-year student seminars on campus, uh, having lunch with uh, doctoral students, uh, uh, had some uh, dinner with faculty members last night, and throughout, actually, um, the conversations haven't been uh, either in their substance or format restricted to life on campus. Actually, throughout, we've been talking about the larger uh, Redlands community and about the ways in which uh, the campus is part of a greater ecosystem uh, of influence, of capital, of power uh, in civic life, and that uh, part of their opportunity and education as students at a university like this is actually to begin to see that fuller ecosystem in its, uh, in its complete breadth uh, and depth. So um, I've just been really loving learning about this community, and I'm really glad to be here tonight. Um, what I wanted to do this evening is actually tell you a little bit about the work that uh, we do at Citizen University um, and frame up some ideas for you uh, for thinking about what it means to exercise power in civic life. Uh, and, um, and after that, uh, we will leave some time for conversation. And if conversation takes the form of questions for me, that's fine. But uh, if you're moved more in the spirit of town meeting or Quaker meeting just to rise and want to uh, share a thought, uh, that, that's fine too. Uh, need not be just kind of uh, hub spoke uh, to me. So um, let me give a bit of uh, context for the work that I do. Um, I'm the founder of this nonprofit called Citizen University, and we are based in Seattle, but we do work all around the United States. Uh, and our work is fundamentally about trying to democratize understanding of how power works in civic life. And the way we do that is through a whole wide range of programs uh, uh, and, and projects, uh, but all of them uh, whether they are city-based, uh, as many of them are in cities and communities around the country, uh, or if they are constituency-based, uh, as some others are in working with uh, uh, veterans or uh, immigrant rights activists or artists or uh, uh, K-12 educators. Uh, in either sense, uh, what we're trying to do is to just lay out some foundational notions of literacy in power. And I actually want to unpack for you what I mean when I talk about literacy in, uh, in power and when I talk about citizen power. Let me actually define my terms here, both halves of the term citizen power. So in the first place, when I say citizen, whether in the context of this topic or in, the, in just naming our organization, um, I'm not talking about documentation status under the immigration and naturalization laws of the United States. I'm not talking about papers. I'm talking about a more capacious ethical sense of being a member of the body, being a contributor to community, uh, being a pro-social contributor to community who's thinking about 
uh, ways to uh, exercise responsibility uh, as part of that ecosystem and community. Um, in, in a word, I'm talking about being a non-sociopath, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, which is a useful definition these days for, for, for a citizen. Um, and I think that one of the things that uh, is really important in naming that, um, uh, you know, certainly in the state of California, but in our times generally in this country, um, it's really worth remembering that while documentation matters and legal citizenship status matters for many reasons, um, the reality is, and we know this and we feel this in our lives every day, there are plenty of people in this country who have the papers but do not live like citizens in this bigger ethical sense that I mean. And there are plenty of people who lack the papers yet do. And that notion of citizen uh, in this broader capacious sense is really foundational for our approach. We work with folks, uh, whatever their documentation status. Power. Let me define just briefly what I mean by that. I mean simply a capacity to ensure that others do as you would like them to do. <laughs> right? So that creates nervous chuckles and uh, makes people think, uh-oh, you know, this is like, you know, domineering, this is bullying, this is Game of Thrones, this is House of Cards, some kind of evil dark arts, right? Um, no. All I'm talking about is being a human in the company of other humans, right? In every circle of our lives, whether with our loved ones, with our neighbors, with our coworkers, with people uh, in a larger community, a campus community, um, we as humans are always trying to get others to do as we would like them to do. Uh, uh, and, and that capacity, that yearning, that desire, when applied to questions of common interest and public concern, is what you might think of as civic power, right? And yet the, pow the word power itself has this, it has this dirtiness attached to it, right? People don't like to name it. They don't like to talk about it. Uh, it, it feels kind of sordid to be so candid about power. And yet, I would submit to you that if you have qualms, misgivings about being direct in naming power, uh, that this is the time to get over it. Because we live in a time right now in this country uh, where if you are unable to even name power, much less the radical, severe depths of inequality of power in this country, um, then we have no shot at remedying what ails the body politic. We've got to first be able to name and see squarely as adults what it is that we are, what, what it is that is flowing like currency uh, or current uh, through the ecosystem of civic life. So that's what I mean by citizen power. And when I um, talk about citizen power in the context of our work at Citizen University, uh, or also um, lay out this notion of thinking about it uh, in the pages of, uh, of my book, You're More Powerful Than You Think, um, I talk about how there are three laws of power uh, in civic life. And I want to just name these three laws briefly and describe three imperatives for action that flow from each of these laws. Um, and, and then from there, I actually want to say a word just about um, uh, the moral context within which we uh, exercise power. Uh, and from there, we can just open it up to conversation. So three laws. Law number one, power compounds. That's so obvious as to not really even need explicit statement, but power compounds, it concentrates. The rich get richer. People who get some media attention get more media attention. Academics who are cited in some papers tend to get cited in more papers, right? The compounding nature of advantage, and by corollary, the compounding nature of disadvantage is one of the most basic laws of nature, not just human interaction and social systems, but all systems. It is why as summer turns to fall and leaves start falling, leaves will clump in certain areas. Why? Because once some start clumping, more start clumping there, right? This is the nature of nature, right? But when it comes to power and human systems, uh, this reality that when left to itself, a system like our economy, a system like our polity, um, does not magically in some mechanical perpetual motion machine way uh, restore itself to equilibrium. Systems left to themselves tend toward intense clumping and concentration of resource, which tend, if left alone, to lead the entire system to collapse. I've just recounted for you the 2007-2008 financial crisis, right? This nature of systems in the way that power compounds, advantage compounds, and so does disadvantage. So that's law number one. Law number two, power justifies itself. So at every turn, incumbent holders of power, whether they are individuals or institutions, are always working hard to spin elaborate narratives about why it ought to be that way, right? 
And those narratives can take the form of scientific theory, quasi-scientific theory. Uh, they can take the form of myth. Uh, they can take the form of, uh, you know, kind of storytelling and narrative that has uh, uh, the, the air of religion about it. Uh, there was a time when uh, we, uh, when, when humans bought into a story uh, of uh, power concentration uh, that said that, you know, I should rule because I am actually descended from God, right? Uh, I, maybe I'm the son of God, or at least I'm lineally descended from God. And that is the basis. Divine right is the basis of my being emperor or king uh, of this land, of this realm, right? And we today in 21st century America can kind of laugh at, can you believe people used to, you know, really buy into this idea that a ruler was actually the son or the, you know, lineal descendant of God, and on that basis they were legitimate rulers, we might laugh at that, and yet if we look today at our own economic life in the United States, we have a secular version of this kind of economic royalism, this kind of divine right notion of self-justification. Uh, and you can shorthand it as trickle-down economics. Right? Trickle-down economics is a storyline, a fable, if you will, uh, in which a tiny number of quote-unquote job creators, business people who are wealthy and therefore are to be worshipped like gods, to be paid tribute, to be coddled, certainly not to be inconvenienced with higher taxes or uh, meddlesome regulations, right? Um, are to be put on a pedestal. And if we pray enough and worship them enough, then perhaps some of their prosperity will leak its way down to the rest of us, right? Th th that is essentially, uh, you know, with sarcasm, that is essentially, uh, the, the, in a nutshell, the argument of supply-side trickle-down economics that the super wealthy are job creators, they must be coddled so that their prosperity can work its way down to the rest of us. Now, there are many things you can say about that story, uh, but uh, it's, it, the, the most important thing, we're in a room of science, we're in a building of science, is that there is no science behind that story. That story is an intimidation tactic masquerading as an explanation for the sources of prosperity. It is saying, don't tax me, because if you tax me, don't force me to raise wages, because if you force me to raise wages, I will have to fire you. I will have to lay you off, and boy, it'd be a shame if I had to fire you, right? That storyline plays out over and over again in Republican administrations, in Democratic administrations. People have internalized that story for the origins of prosperity. And so that is one such example of how power justifies itself. What's another one that's in the news today? White supremacy. The narrative of white supremacy. And I'm not just talking about the folks who carry torches in Charlottesville, but I'm talking about people in every level of institutional life in the United States who just have a default setting that, yeah, the norm is white, that whiteness is normal, that if you do not fit that norm, you have to take an extra step of justifying your presence, of justifying your voice, right? That our politics, our economics, our businesses, our institutions, higher education, philanthropy, art, whatever it might be, that, yes, these are institutions in which whiteness is the default setting because America, the United States, is an institution where whiteness is the default setting. For much of this country's history, that narrative was so prevalent as to be like water to fish. It, it was just there. It was just what people were swimming through, right? Now, because of demographic change, because within sight, we are now within sight, and you in California are quite within sight of a day in which we become a majority people of color country, now we're beginning to realize, wait a minute, this is water. <laughs> what, 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 am I, what am I breathing here? What am I drinking? What am I filtering? This is water. And I'm not sure I like the taste of this water. I'm not sure I accept this medium through which I've been moving and which is shaping our sense of mobility and movement and placement in the system, right? So that's another example of a narrative of self-justification. So if all you had were these first two laws of power, number one, that it's always concentrating, and number two, that it's always justifying itself, you'd get into a pretty grim doom loop, right? <laughs> the situation where a smaller and smaller number of people are telling everybody else why it is that they get to rule over them and why you ought to be happy about it. What and by the way, that kind of doom loop, that kind of monopolization and that justification of monopoly um, is a description of many other societies on earth. It is also a description of many places within a few miles of here, right? All throughout the United States, 
Yes, we are a democratic republic, and yet marbled throughout the actual social and economic reality. If we were to devise an ESRI map, you know, a global information systems technology to map civic, social, and economic power, we would see that marbled through all of our structures of liberty and equality in this country are this kind of monopolization and justification in the United States. What breaks us out of that doom loop, though, and saves us from it, is law number three, which is simply this. Power is infinite. Sit with that for a minute. I don't mean it in some New Age way. And I don't mean it in some, uh, you know, pop psychology way that if you just manifest it and just wish yourself to be super wealthy, you will become super wealthy, right? I'm not talking about the secret. Um, I'm not talking about stuff like that, about um, if, if you just believe enough that, you'll be, uh, that you're powerful, that you'll be powerful. What I mean simply is this, that in civic life, in what seemed to be stuck, zero-sum, incredibly grindingly unequal situations. It is entirely possible to generate brand new power out of thin air through the magic act of organizing. Organizing, inviting one other human to join you in a collective endeavor, in a common endeavor where you have to set common objectives and devise common strategies and figure out how you're going to bring other folks into this common endeavor. That work of organizing generates brand new power where it did not previously exist, and it completely changes the nature of the system. And this sort of cuts against some of our intuitions, which perhaps we derive from the physical world, right? Physics teaches us that in a closed system, if somebody gets more heat or energy, somebody else has to get less, because the conservation of energy and the laws of thermodynamics tell us that we are a zero-sum system here, and that's the nature of nature, right? But the thing is, I'm not talking about physics. I'm talking about civics. And in civic life, you can generate brand new power out of thin air and create new pockets of power that add in a positive some way, not a zero some way, to what is circulating in the ecosystem. Now, that's only a temporary state of affairs. If you, for instance, as a worker organizer, decide to organize your fellow workers and decide to, uh, uh, to uh, lobby for higher wages and to form a union or do something like that, um, those in the pre-existing array of power uh, on the employer side don't just look back at that and say, well, they've generated new power. I guess we have to accept a relative diminution in our own clout, right? No, they counter-organize, right? <laughs> they counter-organize and they start figuring out how to manipulate and buy legislators to make sure that you have right-to-work laws. They start figuring out how you actually limit the ways in which cities in a state can experiment with raising the minimum wage. They start counter-organizing. And this, which in turn leads the worker organizers to counter-counter-organize, right? It is a perpetual contest of the activation of an infinite amount of power. And there is a word for this work of surge, counter-surge, blooming forms of power emerging in different parts of the system and blooming forms meant to counter and balance it. The word for that is politics. Politics in a democracy. Right? At our best, when our system is open, when it is accessible to all, this is what you can expect. Not winner take all, not ultimate victory, but an unending contest for relative advantage. And that's a great thing. That was part of the scheme of our constitutional design. Right? So if you take these three laws, that number one, power compounds and concentrates, number two, that it's always justifying itself, and number three, however, that it is infinite, these yield three imperatives for action that I just want to spend a moment talking about here for us in our lives as citizens. So if in the first place, power is always compounding into these monopolistic winner-take-all sorts of games, our first most basic imperative is to change the game. To change the game. And let me give you an example of that. In Washington State, where I live, a few friends of mine and I, I was on the plane the day that Sandy Hook happened, the Sandy Hook massacre. I was on an airplane. I was at a conference with a colleague of mine, and we were flying back from uh, the East Coast to Seattle. Uh, and we looked on our Twitter feeds, and we saw that everything was going crazy about this massacre. Um, and we decided on that five-and-a-half-hour plane ride that by the time we landed, we needed to do something. We needed to have had some plan to get some other group of people to join us to do something about this. We landed. The next day, we called a breakfast meeting of a few other concerned, active, connected citizens of Seattle and Washington State. 
Um, and by the end of that week, we had formed an entity that had the loose name, the Washington Alliance for Gun Responsibility. And our view was, and we named this very deliberately, our view was that um, gun rights are part of the Constitution, but that a culture of rights can only work if it's balanced with a culture of responsibility. And that you're not being gun control or anti-gun rights or anti-Second Amendment to say responsibility matters here. So we formed this organization, uh, and we decided one of the first things we'd try to push uh, in our state was a system of uh, universal background checks for purchases of firearms. And we initially worked within our state legislature, which uh, at the time still is, uh, well, actually at the time, both chambers were controlled by Democrats. The governor was a Democrat. And we thought, great, this seems to be a hospitable environment for the enactment of this kind of legislation. Boy, were we wrong. <laughs> because what we did not understand sufficiently at that time, uh, just looking at that thing, at, at that general picture, was the ways in which the gun lobby, and particularly the NRA in Washington state, had played a very effective inside game. And that they understood that, yes, whilst, while as a, numerically Democrats held a majority in the House, in the legislature, that all it took was a handful of moderate swing district Democrats for the NRA to be able to apply pressure on and to get gun owners in their districts, their constituents, to apply pressure on them to not want to put their vote behind this kind of legislation. The NRA was really good at their job, really good at the inside game. And we lost in the legislature. And it was a Democrat, a Democrat who killed the bill, right? And we thought, wow, we've got to change the game. We cannot play the inside game. We don't have, a, it's going to take too long to change the inside game. Fortunately, like you, we in Washington live in a state where you have the means of bypass. And we could go to direct democracy. And we said, well, if the legislature is not going to do this, we're going to organize, collect 300,000 signatures, and put a measure on the ballot. And that is precisely what we did. And when we did that, not only did, in the end, that ballot measure win by over 60%, and we became the first state in the union to pass by vote of the people background checks for firearm purchases, but what we, <clears throat> <clears throat> but what we did, it was actually a blessing in disguise. What we did by being forced to get out of the inside game and go to the outside game, to expand the arena, to have to collect hundreds of thousands of signatures meant you couldn't just argue with lobbyists and with a small handful of really experienced legislators. You had to go convince people block by block, community by community, gun owners as well as non-gun owners, NRA members, who a, major a majority of whom supported this measure. Right? This was not an anti-gun. This was not a democratic. This was not a left-wing measure. This was a common-sense responsibility measure, and the, and the margin of victory reflected that in our state. But that is an example of changing the game. Now, look. I imagine there are NRA members or gun owners in this room who don't like the policy, the public policy that I and my fellow citizens enacted there. That's great. That's fine. We should have a nice fight and debate about the pros and cons of background checks and so forth. The larger point here is about how you change the game, right? The first imperative. So the second thing is if in the second place, power is always justifying itself and telling stories about why it is that those who rule ought to rule, then our second most basic imperative is to change the story. And one of the great examples of that actually comes from the Tea Party. I think the Tea Party, uh, though it's changed in its institutional form and has you know, mutated in different movements and, and different times, when you rewind back to the emergence of the Tea Party, and you rewind back to the ways in which spontaneously, after Rick Santelli on CNBC made a call, angry call on air, about how the stimulus and these financial bailouts were just, you know, government spending run amok, federal control run amok. When you, when you rewind back to the ways in which people in this country, and especially in the state of California, spontaneously organized multi-thousand person conference calls, giant Facebook meetings, giant in-person town meetings, spontaneously organized to do something about this and form the Tea Party, that one of the things they were able to do so successfully was to change the story, right? That the story that the Obama administration was telling uh, about the Recovery Act and about the bailouts was one of emergency and rescuing the economy. And what the Tea Party said was, no, 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 no. This is just an unbelievable power grab by federal officials who already are addicted to unbelievable power grabs. And they were able very successfully to frame a counter-narrative, 
that was so effective that it changed the course of American history and politics. At no time, at no time was the Tea Party a majority of Americans. At no time was the Tea Party a majority even of the Republican Party, right? But we have to remember, and one of the most important things to remember about civic life and civic power is that majority rule is always determined by minority will. A fired up, focused, dedicated minority that is able to use the tools of narrative and reframing can completely change the story and the frame of the possible for the rest of politics. One of my friends, Mark Meckler, who is a Californian, one of the co-founders of the Tea Party Patriots, um, uh, left the Tea Party uh, when he found that it was getting too co-opted by establishment Republican Party uh, machinery, uh, and he went off to found another organization called Citizens for Self-Governance. Citizens for Self-Governance is doing a very interesting thing, which itself is an example of how you change the story. Uh, th th their big project um, is to activate Article 5 of the United States Constitution. So we, we are three days past Constitution Day, so I'll give you kind of a belated quiz here. What does Article 5 tell us we can do? Anybody know? Say again. Yeah, Article 5 gives the people, through the states, the power to call their own constitutional convention. Right? It is the built-in circuit breaker in the Constitution. Right? It's different from the amendment process. This is actually, if you get two-thirds uh, 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 of the states actually to uh, pass a resolution calling for a new convention, you can have, you can do 1787 all over again, right? So what Citizens for Self-Governance is doing is they are changing the story from the usual fight about federal spending and federal overreach, which after a while people stop hearing. It just sounds like same old kind of, you know, right-left politics. They are changing the story to say, it is time actually to rewind to the founding principles of the Constitution. It is time actually to reclaim the vision of limited government, decentralized power, and delegated responsibilities that the founders laid out. And the only way to do that is to use the tool that founders gave us, that they left on the table there saying, in case of emergency, break glass, right? <laughs> and they're saying, it's an emergency, you gotta break the glass, you gotta call an Article V Constitution. And they have been working assiduously, state by state, to get legislatures to pass resolutions calling for an Article V Constitution. Now, many people on the left have been kind of laughing it off initially, and now as the number of states are, is rising, passing these resolutions, they're not laughing anymore, right? And they're starting to realize, oh, holy cow, like, it's not imminent, and there probably aren't enough states at the end of the day in our current array of politics for it to happen immediately, but it's getting close, right? Now, you can tell from my background in politics, I do not support the policy objectives of the Article 5 Convention and this Convention of States that uh, Mark and his colleagues are, are, are calling, but as a student of civic power and as somebody who runs an organization, Citizen University, that works with everybody ranging from Tea Party co-founders to Black Lives Matter activists, ranging from $15 now activists to some of the most uh, uh, powerful people in civically minded corporate America, uh, running the gamut from dreamers and immigration activists to folks who are um, from the center right. We work with folks across the political spectrum as long as they meet one standard. Are they interested in activating bottom-up citizen power right now? If you're interested in that, we want to play with you, right? And that's why we've been playing and learning from people like Mark Meckler of Citizens for Self-Governance as much as we've been learning from folks uh, on the opposite side of the spectrum. But this idea here of what Mark's doing is to change the story of politics and to change the story by rewinding, taking us out of what seems like 20th and 21st century fights about big government, small government, federal spending, so on and so forth, to say, no, 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 this is a story about the founders, the framers, the Constitution, and what the heck we're doing here in this republic, right? I tip my hat to them for their ability to use this narrative frame. So the third imperative then, if power is in fact infinite and can be generated out of thin air any time, and yet so many people, perhaps some of you in this room, are stuck in a mindset that says, no, no, it's finite, it's zero sum, I don't have enough, there's no way I can get more, right? Then our imperative is to change the equation. And how do you change the equation? You change the equation by activating networks. And so let me give you two examples of networks that have completely changed the equation uh, in civic life just in recent times. 
so one um, is something that maybe some of you are involved in called indivisible. Anybody here involved in indivisible? Okay, so a handful of people. Let me tell the rest of you what indivisible is. So this uh, uh, January, right as uh, uh, the new president was getting inaugurated, a group of young, four young former congressional staffers wrote a document, maybe a 20-page document, really detailed document, laying out this game plan for how you, as a citizen, can apply very specific, very effective kinds of pressure on your member of Congress, right? This was like an insider's guide to how to bypass the noise, how to bypass the gatekeepers, how to show up at the right kind of town meetings with a certain kinds of demand, how not just to call the office or send an email, but how to call this person on staff, how to find these people, how to mobilize these folks. It was this 20-page playbook by former congressional staffers on how to apply this kind of jujitsu pressure on your member of Congress to make them buckle, right? Um, and, uh, of course, coming at, at the time when it did, when there was a lot of hunger uh, in the country for some set of tools to be able to respond to these incredibly dramatically changed uh, political circumstances, that document, as they had hoped, went incredibly viral. Like, overnight, it was being shared and circulated by first by the thousands, then by the tens of thousands, and by the hundreds of thousands on Twitter and Facebook and everywhere else. That was their plan. That was the, it succeeded beyond their wildest dreams. What had not been in their plan, what they didn't expect, was what happened next. And what happened next was that people, after they downloaded this document and shared it, decided that, hey, those of us who live in Redlands and read this document and, are really, and gave it a like and think this is a really cool thing, let's meet. Let's meet at the, at the Starbucks here. Let's meet on campus at U of R. Let's meet in this part of town at the pub, wherever, whatever it might be, on Sunday morning, and let's talk about the document. Let's talk about the ways in which this playbook for applying pressure to a member of Congress um, is something that we can put into effect not only when the member of Congress comes back for recess, but how we might be able to take that same playbook and bring it to bear on the city council here. Bring it to bear on the body that's making plans about your, your, your development plan. To bring it to the commission that's thinking about the expansion of light rail here to basically practice power, right? And so people started meeting face to face and creating their own completely self-organized, uh, by the way, the document was called Indivisible, right? So these people started meeting face to face and organizing their own indivisible chapters. The four young staffers who'd made this had no control over this, they weren't directing it, but today, you know, eight months later, there are over 7,500 indivisible chapters in the United States. In every congressional district in the country, red, blue, urban, rural, and these are just self-organizing citizens who've decided in these times that it was time to get off the sidelines and time to actually participate. And they change the equation by organizing, by taking inert documents and turning them into active, vital forms of face-to-face -face meeting, and turning that face-to-face -face meeting then into plans for collective action. They used that magic fairy dust that I was talking about of organizing, right? And they changed the equation. Well, here's one other example that has nothing to do actually with electoral or po politics or even policy making, but it's another example of how in this networked age it is wholly possible to change the equation of power. So my friend Mark Friedman, who lives in the Bay Area, um, uh, has run an organization for many years now called Encore. And what Encore is all about is saying that in the United States, we today have all inherited this... Uh, this notion of what retirement is supposed to be, right? And that notion of retirement is basically this kind of vision of golden years, golf courses, you know, uh, all, all that sort of stuff. Um, and it's a vision sold to us by people who run golf courses, people who <laughs> <laughs> run vacation resorts, people who sell financial products that make it possible for you to go to, you know, do these things, uh, that there was this whole infrastructure uh, around selling a particular vision of retirement. And what Mark Friedman said was, you know what, there's a different way to think about this. At this phase of life, during, an, during a time in American history where we are undergoing this kind of longevity boom, people are living longer than ever, um, and you know, retirement age, as it had traditionally been understood, um, no longer marks uh, you know, senescence, it marks actually just the beginning of a new chapter of a new form of engagement in life, right? And he created Encore.org to create a network of people, 60 years and older, 60 years of age and older, 
who wanted to do something civically meaningful in their second act, in what he dubbed their encore careers, right? And he began to build an infrastructure for organizing people age 60 and over to meet each other, to share practices, to highlight examples of the folks who used to work at Esri and they decided uh, after they retired here uh, that they were going to go teach uh, science at, the high, at Redlands High School or the person who used to work at the high school for many years and decided after retiring uh, that she was going to start a nonprofit to serve the very kids who she kept seeing dropping out year after year before graduation, right? All these folks who had life experience, who have connections, who have capital of every kind. And what Mark Friedman was able to do by creating this simple network, an online, primarily online network initially, uh, was to change the equation of what it means to be an elder in America. That what it means today to be an elder in America, he's trying to say, is to be a continuing contributor. And not only a continuing contributor, but a peak contributor. Because you're at a stage when you've amassed this pile of experience, this mound of capital, right? Not just money capital, but relationship capital, experience capital, ideas capital, insight capital, pattern recognition capital. You have this mound of capital at this age in life. And now what he made possible by creating Encore is to not only give you permission, but to create a little bit of a contagious expectation that you should not hoard your, your pile. <laughs> you should not hoard your mound of capital, right? That this is the time of life to begin to circulate that pile of capital. Why? Not just because you're an altruist or a philanthropist or out of the goodness of your own heart, but because this is what will feed you with purpose for the rest of your life, right? And out of this network came something that he created called the Purpose Prize. Some of you may have heard of this. Uh, a prize done in conjunction with the John Templeton Foundation, which, and now AARP runs it, um, where every year five Americans age 60 and over, uh, win prizes of between $25,000 and $100,000 for doing remarkable things in their encore careers that are of service to community and country and planet, right? And so he's changed the equation. I mean, this is a good time to be doing this. The baby boom, the largest generation uh, of, of people entering this phase of life, this retirement phase of life that the country has ever known to activate just a fraction of that energy, that experience, that idealism, that power, that yearning, and that learning toward greater civic ends changes the equation of power in civic life, right? That's not about politics, not red, blue, Republican, Democrat, but it is about saying what used to be inert, dormant, unactivated potential can in fact be awakened, can be tapped with the right design of networks and the right spirit of invitation. So these three imperatives to change the game, change the story, and change the equation of power are the fundamentals of what it means to show up as a powerful citizen. They are the fundamentals of what we teach uh, in our programs at, non, at Citizen University um, in working with all these different constituencies across the board and across the country. Um, but the thing that I want to close on is this. Citizenship is not only about power. It is fundamentally about power and being comfortable with it and being literate in it. Right? And the literacy that I talk about is I'm not just being poetic. I'm not just talking about a metaphor. I actually, I actually mean quite literally how to read and how to write power. Right? Here we are in Esri, kind of a GIS, Global Information Services, mapping Mecca. Right? Every one of you, pretty much everybody in this room who is, who's had some experience in life, should be able to draw a map of power here in Redlands. If I passed out pieces of paper and gave you a pencil, you should be able to draw a map that's not just a picture of the mayor and the city council, but is also a picture of who are the folks in the farming and growing community, in the grow, among the growers and farmers? Who are the folks among the workers and the pickers? Who are the folks at the university? Who are the folks here at Esri and in the tech community? Where are the pockets and the sources and the sinks of power in this community? What are the conduits through which power and influence flow? in this community. Yes, electoral politics. Yes, you know, policy making that's visible in public, but also forums like this. Who shows up to forums like this? I love that we have an almost full house, right? But look around. There are a lot of people who didn't show up for this, demographically, ethnically, class-wise, right? Who shows up for stuff in Redlands? This question of mapping power and be able to see that map is not, as I say, is not just a metaphor. 
But if you can read that map and draw it and recreate it and understand who has money power, who has people power, who, has, who can bring street heat, who has ideas power and narrative power to elevate or to frame or to make a bigger story of us here in this community, who has the power to affect social norms, whether they are local celebrities or they are religious figures, who has the power to activate all these different sources of power? You've got to be able to draw that map. But once you draw that map, you've got to be able to rewrite it. You've got to be able to insert yourself into it, right? And that writing of power is super important. So all of this is to say that power matters. But power alone, while necessary, is utterly insufficient for any deep and lasting notion of democratic citizenship. And I have this very simple, quasi-scientific sounding equation uh, that I offer up to kind of define what I mean by citizenship. And it goes simply like this. Power plus character equals citizenship. Right? If all you have, it is necessary to have that literacy and power to understand it, but if all you have is literacy and power, if all you know is how to work the system, who to talk to, who informally to put a word in their ear to get stuff done, to move things in government, or to get businesses to get on your side, to get funders and philanthropists to do stuff, if all you have is that, but it's completely detached from any moral sense. It's completely untethered to any notion of character in the collective, right? When I say character, I'm not talking about individual personal virtue, diligence and honesty, honesty and perseverance. I'm talking about character in the collective. How do you behave in public? How do we behave with each other, right? Respect, service, mutuality, reciprocity, sacrifice, contribution, right? the norms that actually make us non-sociopaths, right? Character in the collective. If your literacy and power is untethered to a deep, deep grounding in this kind of character in the collective, then you are indeed simply a highly skilled, finely honed sociopath. And so having both sides of this equation, power plus character equals citizenship, is fundamental. And right now, you know, even over this short period of time that I've been spending talking to students and community members and leaders, uh, civic and educational and business and otherwise here uh, in town, um, you know, I think one of the things that is exciting, one of the things that Jim and Deb Fallows told me about, um, and I know they wrote about uh, and, and, and will be writing about in a forthcoming book that's based in part by some of their time spent here um, in fellowship, is the ways in which the future if the body politic of the United States is going to heal itself, it will not heal itself from the top down. It's going to be healing that happens from the middle out and the bottom up. And it's going to be healing which starts from towns the size of Redlands and people the size of you with hearts the size of yours deciding, I'm going to show up a different way. I'm going to get literate in power. I'm going to think about and take stock of what my pile of capital is. I'm going to choose to be a non-hoarder. I'm going to choose to circulate what I've got, however little, however much, however material, however ethereal it may be, right? I'm going to do that. And it's going to happen because in a community like this, which I think you know, but I can tell you from the outside and having talked to folks here, is in many ways still exceptional, right? There aren't a lot of towns, the scale of Redlands, that still have the kinds of organizations that the political scientist, scientist Robert Putnam decried the evaporation of. Elks Clubs, Kiwanis, Rotary, Optimists, right? In my hometown, Poughkeepsie, New York, those things are dead shells, right? In Seattle, there, some are okay, some are dead, right? In Redlands, they're strong, right? But they're strong with, they're not yet as fully inclusive as they could be of the actual diversity of this place. And so our challenge and our opportunity is if we want to heal the body politic from the inside out, from the bottom up and from the middle out, we've got to make a commitment to a radical level of inclusion, a radical level of invitation, of bringing a whole different group of folks into this room for Esri Forms, a whole different group of folks into the circle at your Optimist Club, at your Rotary Club, at your church groups, whatever it might be, and saying, my job as a non-sociopath my job as a citizen of this community, of the state, of this country, and of this planet is to circulate the power I have and to do it in a way that's completely coupled with this notion of character that is greater than self. 
if we do that, and Jim and Deb Fallows are seeing it happen, not just in Redlands, but in towns all across the United States, and I do believe there is a, talk about change the story, they, there is a new narrative that they're part of. There's a new narrative that I'm part of. If, if you should get my book, You're More Powerful Than You Think, you will find it filled with stories, some about community organizing, some about electoral politics, some about groups working to mobilize around disabilities or personal challenges. You will find all kinds of stories of people just like us activating dormant, latent power to make change happen. But we got to do this by making a commitment that's not just a personal commitment, but a collective one. So I want to end actually by inviting you to do the same thing that we started at the beginning, which is for you to actually take a moment, turn to your neighbor, might be the same person you introduced yourself to a, a moment ago, uh, and just say one thing that you think you're going to be able to do in the next seven days. The next seven days. <laughs> one thing. It can be small to show up in civic life in a different way and to circulate the knowledge, the capital, the power, the clout, and the influence that you have. So turn to your neighbor and let's do that for one minute and then let's do Q&A and conversation. <clears throat>
Um, I, I think there's several things that we've, we've all got to do, but particularly we've got to help um, the younger generation do um, to combat fake news. Um, uh, in the first place, um, it is ourselves to commit to having a diversified diet of media, right? If all you do, you know, monoculture in everything is bad for you, right? If all, you, if all I do as someone who is left of center is read stuff that's left of center, I'm going to get sick. I will, right? At first, it'll feel good to me because I'm getting all this confirmation bias and I'm getting all this, you know, I mean, this, this confirmation of my biases, right? Uh, uh, but then what I get really is the feeding of my outrage, right? And I get this kind of reward cycle of feeling more and more righteous about my worldview, right? We ourselves have to kind of diversify our media diet so that it is diverse along ideological dimensions, so that it is diverse, we were talking about this afternoon, uh, di diverse along sectoral focus, right? Those of you in this room who are part of the Esri community, if you're scientists, like you need to be reading arts stuff, right? Those of you who are political and civic nerds like me, I need to be reading the business pages, right? You need to diversify the languages and vocabularies that you are internalizing so that you have a full repertoire, right? Uh, so ideological diversity, kind of uh, 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 subject matter diversity, uh, and then also something we talked about in this class today, metabolism or tempo diversity, right? The danger of one narcissistic person with a giant Twitter following is that he becomes magnetic, he, he becomes like a magnet drawing us all into the tempo and metabolism of a Twitter feed, right? Everybody wants to see what's the latest tweet, what's the latest thing, you know? Um, and our ability to step back, our ability to detach, our ability to reason, our ability to put things in historical context, our ability to argue from fact rather than from feeling gets diminished the more we get sucked into the vortex of Twitter time, right? Follow Twitter if you have social media. I do. But couple the reading of a Twitter feed with the reading of the New York Review of Books, right? Long-form scholarly essays about subjects that you don't know about. It's like, it's like coming to Esri Forum, like learn about subjects in a lifelong learning kind of way that you didn't ever really think about, but they're long. They require patience. They require you to be able to sustain and hold a train of argument or thought for a long time, right? For longer than 140 characters, right? Wait, didn't he say in section one that this? Wait, I got to go back and read that, right? Our ability to hold a thread like that um, is part of what's going to make us fit enough to fight uh, fake news, right? Um, but I think the other thing, too, is, um, you know, this is where I think there are, I don't know that there are easy solutions to this, but I do think that um, one of the ways in which my friends on the left have been part of the problem, have fed the circumstance that has made this a, an environment ripe for fake news, um, is that there have been too many folks on my side of the ideological uh, spectrum um, who have popularized a notion of moral relativism and the non-existence of truth, right? If everybody has a truth, well, you can see some ways in which that's empowering and exciting, but you can also see some ways, we are seeing today some ways in which that is dangerous uh, and noxious, right? Uh, and so I think we've got to make a recommitment to naming some ground truths, uh, in the realm of science, that means being unafraid to name fact uh, and to be able to translate the naming of fact into terms that lay people can understand, right? When scientists talk about how they have 95% certainty, uh, certainty about the effects and the kind of uh, projected consequences of climate change, um, they mean, they're using language that to other scientists is like, that's the gold standard, man. It doesn't get better than 95%. But the wider general public says, oh, there's still 5% unsure, right? I guess it's all up in the air, right? Uh, uh, and, and so I think, you know, we've got to learn uh, how to engage in that way. But I think the, the other uh, piece of this about fighting fake news, apart from naming fact and naming truth, uh, is recognizing that, you know, we've... It's, th this requires, I think, something that... Uh, we were also talking about in class today, um, which is you need to know your own mind. Right? Now, I don't mean 
Like, I know I'm a liberal or I know I'm a conservative. I mean actually be able to excavate what do you believe and why? Which requires you to really have spent deep time considering the alternative. Right? <laughs> really spend deep time considering how someone would believe the opposite of you. Right? One of the projects that we've launched out of my uh, program at the Aspen Institute is called the Better Arguments Project. Uh, and the premise of it uh, is that, you know, in American civic life today, uh, it's not that we need fewer arguments, we just need less stupid arguments. Right? <laughs> <laughs> argument is good, right? Don't shy from argument. Don't try to rush to some false reconciliation like we all agree. We don't all agree. Amer American politics is riven by real deep divides of philosophical outlook, real deep divides of experience, uh, and as we sort residentially and demographically, real deep divides of worldview and aspiration. We need to be grown-ups and face those divides, right? But one of the things that we face is to recognize that not only should we not shy away from argument, we should remember that America itself is an argument. Like all of American civic life is premised on the idea that you have never-ending perpetual fights and tugs of war between liberty and equality, between a Hamilton view of strong central government and a Jefferson view of strong local government. Right? Between color blindness and color consciousness. Right? Between pluribus and unum. Right? All of American politics and American political history is tugs of war along this, these, there's probably six of these core polarities, these core American arguments. Right? Uh, and what we've got to do is to be able to resituate ourselves in history and understand that the fight that's going on right now over repeal of the ACA whatever your thoughts might be on the policy of it and the consequences of it, is not the first time we've had this fight, right? It's not the first time this country has argued about the federal role in providing security to all national citizens. And, there, and if, you, if, like me, you want to kill the Graham-Cassidy bill and you want to save the ACA, it's not enough just to say, they're going to kill millions of babies by doing this, right? This is a moral abomination. They're just going to, you know, wipe out... Uh, the American population. It's not enough just to do kind of scare tactics rhetoric. I need to step into the shoes of people who sincerely, as a matter of principle, believe that blowing up the current healthcare system, giving block grants to states, and then, giving them, and then setting clock for 24 months for them to invent their new healthcare systems state by state is a good idea, right? I can sort of see the case for it. I can see the case for decentralization. I can see the case for pushing responsibility down. I can sort of understand that, right? In the end, I think it's a fallacious and, uh, uh, and cynically told case, uh, but, but there's a case there, right? And I think one way we immunize ourselves against the virus of fake news um, is to be able to know our own mind and to be able to understand how others might see the same thing that we're looking at, right? Um, which will make us less susceptible to stuff that confirms our previously existing biases uh, and prejudices and worldviews. Um, that's, it's, you know, I used the word diet, the metaphor of diet earlier. I mean, this is a civic fitness thing. Like, we got to get in shape, right? We got, that, that requires some shape of how we read, how we consume, how we communicate, and who we circulate with so that we're exposing ourselves um, uh, the way that immunization exposes you to a dose of the virus. <laughs> We've got to expose ourselves to a dose uh, 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 of the countervailing view in order to be immunized from uh, the, the, the dangers of fake news. But I, I don't want to put a Pollyanna shine on it. Like, this is a real menace to the Republic. Right? I don't know how many of you saw the cover story in the New York Times Magazine this Sunday about the Russian propaganda operation and the TV network Russia Today, RT. Uh, and how methodically the Putin uh, regime uh, has built this uh, uh, TV network and the Sputnik uh, online network of websites to, uh, to take advantage of the openness of our American system, right? And to take advantage of our weakness because we're all not so sure that there is such a thing as truth. And into that setting, they just dropped all kinds of fake news viruses, right? And they've been doing it even before and beyond the 2016 presidential election, right? They're doing it in Germany to destabilize Merkel and to destabilize those whose interests they believe are counter to those of Russia, right? They're doing it to try to gin up fake news stories in Germany about how young German teenagers are getting kidnapped, abducted, and raped by 
um, Muslim uh, refugees, right? This one particular story, completely fake news, but it went viral because first Sputnik, their website, and then RT started ginning it up and then started getting it into the mainstream news, started getting their journalists to start asking questions about it at press conferences. And suddenly this fake news was sort of semi-real news, right? That's dangerous. I don't have an easy answer for how we combat that. Um, but I do think at the end of the day, as with everything I believe in civic life, um, the way we combat that, it, it's sort of the way that after this president was inaugurated, people across the board, not just progressives who would fly the banner of the resistance, but actually principled conservatives became very troubled, if not disgusted, uh, by uh, this administration's early uh, over overreaching use of executive power. Uh, progressives as well as principled uh, uh, conservatives uh, uh, in the wake of something like the Muslim ban responded without direction, without me or you or anybody telling them to do it, responded in a spontaneous way like antibodies to a virus, right? Or showing up at airports, showing up at train stations, showing up at courthouses, lawyers organizing, self-organizing into defense committees, right? That happened without anybody coordinating. And I think the way we're going to have to fight news is the same thing. Like, we each have to take a personal sense of responsibility and then swarm as the time comes, right? And be able to get our neighbors and our friends and people on our Facebook groups and uh, to say, well, wait, wait, don't bite at that bait. That's not real. We're not sure that's real, right? Whose agenda is behind that? Like, question these things. Um, I think that's some of the habits that we've got to get into. Um, other questions, and I'm sorry, I'll, 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 I'll okay. increase my yeah, tempo. I was going to say that we have time for one more question. No, <laughs> no, no. Go ahead, sir. Hi, my name is Bob Hancock. I'm a small business owner in, in Redlands. And your last topic actually is a, a segue to this question. I'm curious, in your opinion, whether you feel that social media in general and Facebook in particular has a greater positive potential impact through the relatively open platform that allows people to communicate, organize, um, assemble, virtually speaking or a more dangerous potential due to the fact that the corporate structure really has almost unilateral control over tweaking news feeds, changing algorithms, and controlling the content that people see without us being aware of that? Yeah, what a great question. Um, I think it's a net danger. I, I recognize fully the, the positive side of the ledger, right? Most of the movements of recent years Occupy Wall Street, the Tea Party, Black Lives Matter, the Dreamers. Um, all these things emerged on social media. They, some of them emerged literally from a hashtag on Twitter. And a hashtag begat people indivisible, right? These things would not have happened in the same way without Facebook and Twitter. Um, and so that's a plus, right? I put that on the positive side of the ledger. But there are so many of the negatives, some of which that have to do with the manipulability of what's, uh, what gets put into the bloodstream of uh, of, of the feeds and Facebook and Twitter, some of them, to your point, about the non-transparent uh, means by which ultimately these private sector entities can tweak algorithms um, uh, to yield certain kinds of uh, behavior or results, right? To create a certain kind of outrage, to feed a certain kind of outrage. You've probably all seen the headlines about how Facebook has had to admit um, that during the campaign season um, they saw a business opportunity and they took it to sell ads targeted to people who were doing searches for Jew hating, right? Oh, I see people are doing searches for Jew hater. Great, let's, let's sell them targeted ads, right? Um, the, the thing about tech and the tech community, and I have many friends in the tech community, right? Um, I, I've worked in the tech community. Um, too many people in tech have a blind faith that algorithms are neutral, right? Algorithms are not neutral. There is no such thing as neutral, right? The writing of code, the design of an algorithm itself is a biased act. How the algorithm gets executed compounds bias, right? And the choices that they make at Facebook, uh, uh, you know, when they're insulated from public view, um, present, present danger. Um, and that can be the danger of that, it can be the danger of ways in which, um, um, uh, you know, Twitter. Anyway, there, there are dangers there. But, but there's another danger, too, to these platforms. And um, I think there's an interesting debate here that goes back to the, my law number one about power concentrating and compounding, right? 
Facebook and Twitter are monopolies, right? Google is a monopoly, right? I'm sorry to talk about such big engines of, of, of uh, economic activity here in your state, um, but they are monopolies, and the question is rising now in public policy across the political spectrum, but particularly uh, from the left. The question is rising is, um, is, it is it against the public interest to have these monopolies leveraging their power in such powerful ways on public life, right? Should Amazon, Facebook, Google, Twitter be regulated as public utilities? Should they be put at a minimum to the common carrier responsibilities that the FCC places on um, other telecommunications platforms, right? Uh, right now, um, th these tech platforms are uh, utterly exempt from this kind of regulation. And I think um, the economic power, you know, we live in a time where a handful of tech titans, right now they are, they seem to be benevolent, right? They seem to be of goodwill and, you know, uh, social, you know, uh, conscience. <laughs> I want someone to write me and, and sign a contract guaranteeing that that will always be the case, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, because it won't be. And that, uh, those platforms um, can just as easily uh, be put to uh, 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 very divisive, uh, very dangerous use. So what is the antidote to that? I mean, I think it is more regulation. I think it is more public pressure brought by citizens um, for these platforms to self-regulate uh, more effectively and to be more transparent, right? Only after a lot of public pressure the last few days uh, has Facebook decided to share with Congress uh, the scope, the range, and the nature of ads that they sold to Russian bots and Russian um, uh, entities during uh, the presidential election, right? There is a giant panoply of these entities based in Russia that were buying targeted ads, creating fake events, creating fake stories, you know, spreading the story that the Pope had endorsed Donald Trump, right? That came out of Russia. That came out of Russia, and we laugh, but let me tell you how many millions of people believed it. Right, um, and so Facebook now is getting pressure from citizens to not do that stuff in the shadows in a way that they can keep profitable and keep their clients happy, uh, but has to have some measure of public interest involved. Other questions? Claire, or... did you have a question on your side? Oh, one right here. Okay. Right. Oh, okay. Thank you. And then this will be. I know. This, I wanna, oh, yeah, we're, oh will... we're well past our usual time. Yeah, so we'll, I'm sorry. We'll take so this, this will be last question. this will be the last one. Yeah. <clears throat> Hmm. Yeah, so uh, I always think it's a good idea in these highly polarized, charged times to answer a question like that. What, are you turning into a socialist? With a question, right? What makes you think what I've just said is socialist? Like, and not in a provocative, like, you know, I want to I wanna, I wanna pick on you kind of thing, but genuinely, I'm interested. I just said we should support young undocumented immigrants and give them a pathway to citizenship in the United States. I'm interested to know what part of that activated in your brain the keyword socialist, right? And invite them to unpack it. Well, it's because, you know, it's just the federal government, you know, doing all this stuff. It's, it came from Obama bypassing Congress and, you know, whatever the thing that will kind of unspool from that is material for you to use to learn this person's mind and heart. Right? Um, and I think that that's, uh, um, I actually think there's a cycle that we've got to break in American politics that um, uh, I want to tell you about that, come, that was shaped, that I learned about from a, a mentor of mine. Uh, and I smile because he's somebody I only met uh, about uh, six weeks ago. 
uh, but, but I read his book uh, about a decade ago, and I used his book, and you continue to use his book in a deep way, and I want to tell you about it. He's a guy named C. Terry Warner. He's a um, retired uh, professor of psychology, organizational uh, psych behavior at BYU in Provo, Utah. And he wrote this book in like 2001, I think, uh, maybe 2002, called Bonds That Make Us Free. And the core message of this book, Bonds That Make Us Free, um, is that in human behavior, whether um, in a dyad of a relationship with your loved one or a friend, um, at the level of group to group in a city, uh, at the level of Israeli to Palestinian, at the level of whatever scale, there is a human dynamic that unfolds the cycle of collusion that he describes this way. I accuse you to excuse me. Okay? So, me and my wife, it's been a long day, we're home, and I come home and I'm like, why didn't you take out the trash? Right? And her response to me is, well, why didn't you do the dishes? Right? Accuse to excuse. Right? You have Black Lives Matter activists catalyzed by this unending parade of police killings of unarmed black men. And they are moved to say black lives matter, by which they mean simply black lives ought to matter. Black lives also matter. Black lives should finally matter, right? All of these kind of implied parentheticals. They say black lives matter. And the response to, to that from so many people, all lives matter. Blue lives matter, right? Not hearing you say black lives matter, not asking why do you say black lives matter? What do you mean by that, right? But just hearing it as an accusation that must be rebutted with a counter accusation, right? We've got to break that cycle. There is, there is one tried and true way to break that cycle. You know what it is? It is to break that cycle. <laughs> it is to set in motion a cycle not of responsibility shirking, but of responsibility taking, right? Someone calls me a socialist, I don't go and call them some, you know, sociopathic libertarian ass, right? <laughs> um, I say, why do you call me a socialist? It's interesting. Like, what is it that's moving you to want to characterize me that way, right? Well, because da 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 And then I can say, I, I get that in part, but you, you understand, like, that, that's not where I'm coming from, which hopefully, if it's a, you know, in the, in the, in between the 30-yard lines of kind of sanity, um, uh, it, it creates space for this person to, you know, if I've yielded a little bit, it creates space for this person to say, you know what, I probably throw around these labels too easily. Right, um, I know. I I watch Fox News. I you know I, you know I just get into the habit. Right, um, socialist. You're you're just socialist. Right, if you disagree with me, and now we each have taken a little bit of responsibility. That doesn't mean that we'll walk out of there holding hands and agreeing on the future of the republic, but what it does mean is that we have rehumanized our interaction. Right, we will have broken a cycle of dehumanization, and you know I would love it if this behavior of breaking the cycle of accused to excuse could be modeled from the presidency on down, but it's not going to be anytime soon. And it's going to be up to us in a bottom-up way, in a contagious side-to-side, peer-to-peer way to model it. We have to model it, right? And that breaking of that cycle, that taking of responsibility um, is about naming the ways in, sh in which we are named and taking responsibility not only for our part in the polarization in our cycle, but naming the ways in which we have contributed to it, right? And I think if we have that mindset here tonight, then together we are going to be exercising a different kind of collective uh, civic power. Thank you very much for being here tonight. <clears throat>